We want you first to think of like a mechanical sound that you can remember back from during, you know, what was happening, a sound that you remember. First find the sound and then we'll work on trying to spell it. Have you heard a grenade? No. No. <laughs> no. Except on TV. Yeah, yeah only on TV. But not put a know. movie in and just make it so... <laughs> what, um, oh, so in your... Like, did it have some sharp, sharp, <laughs> sharp crackling? Uh, it's anyway. like when something falls down, like, but it has so many. It, it starts with a P. Pua. It starts with a P. Pua. And how do you write that? <laughs> Pua. You have to make it up like what it sounds like. Pua. Pua, but it has to have lots of vibrations to it because you said it goes. In. Yes, exactly. Yeah, have one of them really come up. I mean, all the way up, you know. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. Oh gosh, that's really scary. What, did they just throw them into a house or something? Yeah, to somebody's house. They they didn't do much of that, but it was so weird because what usually we were, it was more of a knife type of genocide, yeah. you know? But when you heard the grenade, you would know, well, then that is... It was something really Something bad, right? really big. Yeah. You know, they want to maybe... I don't know, destroy some building, some big yeah. building they came and, you know, a grenade and just put it down like there was never a house there. Oh gosh. So. Uh, New York. Um, this is New York. But I never read of this New York when I was a kid. It's New York Yankees. Yeah, it's in New York Yankees. But I didn't know it was NY until I was about 11 or 12 years oh, old. Oh really? Yeah. Hmm. I, I thought it was like the Jolly Roger, you know, the, which is the uh, pirate flag without the skeleton. With the crossbow and the skull, yeah, <laughs> and um, and I was a Brooklyn Dodger fan, and, and Brooklyn was really, uh, really simple. It was a, just a really easy B to read, so it was like the good guys. And when I saw this, this reminded me of the bad guys. Okay, and when I was three years old, three or four years old, my mother saved this for me. I made a book, and she, she wrote it, and it was like the um, the good ship versus the bad ship, the little police boat. <laughs> But on its adventures, it meets a pirate boat, and this is the pirate boat, 
and you see the flag mm -hmm. with the two X's on it? Mm -hmm. That was based on the Yankee symbol. Oh. As a little kid, me interpreted it in that Yankee <laughs> symbol. Okay, the bad guys. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking that the, the evil Yankees, who everybody in Brooklyn hated the Yankees. Mm -hmm. So, um, <laughs> and, and, and I was trying to make the pirate ship. Yeah, and, I started, and then when I was 11 years old, I found that it was just two letters put together. Mm -hmm. So I emotionally related to this as a symbol and as a new kind of letter or language. You see? And so now Caroline's going to explain to you some of the things we're going to do. So now, um, what I'm going to have you do is the first thing you need to do is um, you need to think of a specific incident of a memory you have. And once you have the particular memory in your mind, then I'll tell you what we'll do next. But first, think of an incident in your mind that's related to the, the genocide or the, the Holocaust. Do you have an incident? Do you have something? Do you have something? Okay, so with this incident in mind, you're going to create a word, not a real word, but a word that you create from the sounds or the letters that describe this incident. Just one word. Well, we were driven across the border from Romania to Poland. I mean, not driven by car, but they threw us out, the Romanian soldiers, the border patrol. And when we got to Poland, there was the Polish militia waiting for us there. And they did not want us there. They wanted to take us back. And um, we did not want to go because we knew that they will go back the same way we came through the border, just it was just feels that the Romanians are going to kill us. And my father, who was kind of the leader of the group, he says, if you have a right, kill us here, but we are not going to go back. And I was 10 years old, and I walked up to my father, and I said to my father, Daddy, give them everything. I want to live. I want life. Let's change them instead of... Edith chose the word life. Caroline helped to rearrange the letter so as not to spell a real word. The letter F represented Edith's father, the letter I represented Edith, and the letters L and E represented the Polish militia. Next, and then who's next, and then who's next. So maybe your father looks more like, the, maybe you can make the F really big. It's like a father yeah. figure. Yeah. Can we them backwards too? And then which one is next? Which one is you? Do you see yeah. yourself as the I or the E? It could be the I. I. Ha ha, let me, let me tell you what happened. Uh, after we were freed, the uh, German Air Force came to bomb the camp camp. I was outside the camp, in, in a little bit close to a little house. I figured if the bomb falls on that house, or next to it, it's going to kill me. So I said, if I go under the bed, even if the, holes, even if the house falls in, the bed is going to protect me. So while they were bombing, I was under the bed, hiding under the bed. And when I came out, I said, ha ha, how foolish. <laughs> so <that's funny. laughs> right away, this struck me as the, they will have this traditional dance back home. Uh, to me, you know, the Rwandan dance is the best dance I've mm -hmm. ever seen anywhere in the world. Or where those places have been, it's very elegant, very gracious, and women really do it in a very elegant way. And that's what I saw in this. So that's why I liked it, and I love the dance. Mm -hmm. I really, when I, when I watch the dance, the dancers, I just, I have these shivers of joy and 
it just moves me so much. I can watch it and watch it and watch it for hours. And I picked the same thing in here. It's graceful, this graceful dancing, softness. And this little thing she put here, it's almost like a basket they make back home. So there's a lot of it. And then uh, the, this was my, the, the cry of people in the genocide where they forget the gracefulness in their tradition. And there is this sadness that comes in, kind of uh, um, shadows all those beauty, all that beauty. And so that's what I thought. Really. Excellent. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Alice Tuza is a survivor of the Rwandan genocide. She was nine years old when the genocide began in 1994. She came to the U.S. in 2001. Edith Goodman was 10 years old in 1941 when she and her family were deported from Romania. She survived the Holocaust at labor camps. Florianne Brown is Alice's sister. She was in West Africa during the Rwandan genocide. She chartered a plane to rescue Alice and the rest of her surviving family members who had fled to Zaire, now the Democratic Republic of Congo. Florianne came to the U.S. in 1988. Max Goodman was deported from Romania during the Holocaust when he was 17 years old. He met Edith after the Holocaust and they married in 1950 and moved to the U.S. in 1959. When Florian and Alice came to my studio, I wanted them not to be nervous and worry about uh, telling uh, uh, stories that were really personal. So the idea was to have them loosen up and just draw arbitrary images with a roller. And we chose uh, blue and orange because they were opposite colors. And then we allowed them to um, choose which color they wanted to use. And uh, Alice uh, started the, the process by using a blue roller. And she did this great big circle with these um, lines coming out of it. And, uh, and everybody was laughing and she was having a good time. Um, later we found out that that was a, uh, it wasn't arbitrary, it was very meaningful. I didn't know I was going to be painting, which I'm not a good painter, because I'm not an artist, obviously. But did you, did you enjoy it? Like, do you remember that first day putting down? Yeah, I enjoyed the, the role, oh. Laura's and like, when we would uh, take the, the paint and just let it drip yeah. over, mm -hmm. you know, just, I never knew that uh, just something so little can mean so much in yeah. a painting. There's so many meanings behind just that little drop falling yeah. off the paint. The reason why I use the rollers um, is because it, it makes a, a lot of color happen fast. <laughs> and we cover the entire canvas within like 15 minutes. And that was really important that we get that image down and that people feel relaxed and that they don't have to have the pressure of having to say something or do something correctly. We'll bring it back over here. And, uh, <sighs> At the first Voice Division session with Edith and Max Goodman, sheets of color were laid on the ground, and everyone discussed which colors would represent the good times and the bad times the Goodmans endured through the Holocaust and their life together. These colors were used to begin the painting. Well, I, would, I guess I would choose that dark one for the not-so-good times. Because you guys which, were talking, which one? This is dark gray. Yes. That one right there. Because you were talking about the winter and how cold it was and mud and um, that's just kind of a wintry color. I Try was, to get ideas. Go ahead. I, I was thinking between 
that color and this color as soon as I saw it. Uh, for which one? The, for the for the bad times. This one? This, this or this. this? This one? Yeah, this or this. Okay. I thought this color. Yeah. yeah, I thought this color. Mm -hmm. yeah. Powerful. Yeah. Is that the one you like, Max? For the bad time, this, this, and this. Mm -hmm. I think so. <laughs> I think so. Uh, I agree in the dark one, but see, to me, the other one, I see when we were in heaven, it's when we were. Which other one? This here. The tan? Yeah, the tan. When okay. we were there and, and, and <clears throat> field just, and the dust there, and we just had a little straw. Okay. That there to where we were. That's the first time when I saw a dead person because usually when somebody died, they just buried it. But then somebody very pious died and they washed and cleansed them. And it was near our space there. And I was a child standing and looking how they were. And and this, you know, I can still see him dead and how they were pouring water or whatever. And that place where we were looked so what? Desert. Des yeah, okay. dust yeah that's desert you know okay. that and the yellow straw good so, okay we're going to use both yeah. of them the painting started with the two colors that represented the bad times I believe this is a picture of Florian and her friends before anything happened in Rwanda. And um, the other thing that we, that we went through your pictures and we still may be going through more of them, um, but we, we kind of got locked into this image over here of, um, of, your, of your family when they're posing on the dock. Do you remember that picture? Do you remember that picture? <coughs> oh, it's, is that the same thing over there? Was yeah, except, that the except what we did is we thought it would be more expressive to work with the uh, reflections in the water, so we turned it over. This, this was a high school picture. Okay, high school picture. Yeah, it's a high school picture somewhere we went to visit uh, Lago so, Mohasi. So are you in it? Uh, am I in it? Yeah. Yes, I am. And who else is in it? Anybody? Classmates. Some old classmates. I'm right at the beginning, right here. That picture shows my time when there was peace. I didn't. I was not there during the war. It's both of us coming together. We're coming from the same family, but we have different experiences. And I've come from a peaceful time. And she draws this house, and that house is sitting in, in a tumultuous time. You know, the war. And her, she she has memories of the war. I have memories of peace. So that those are two very contradicting things, but that speak loud. So these people looking at a peaceful time and wondering what has happened to this time we lived in and this time where things went chaotic. She has a very different story. I have a different story. We come together and then we have to match it and figure out how to. In Romania, the Jews in northern Bukovina, where Edith and her family lived, were the first people deported. They were forced out of their home in July of 1941. And they took us to Ataki, to the river there. 
it was in the summertime, must have been in the end of July or so. I don't remember exactly the date. And that's where that lady that was in our group died. I remember very clearly a black color, unfortunately. And uh, there were two elderly ladies with us from our group. One was left alive still, and we couldn't take her along because she couldn't walk and there was nobody there to carry her. And the one that died, my mother covered her with a black sheet, with a black piece of fabric, and I don't know how she had this piece of fabric. Do we have any uh, paper? Maybe we can get uh, Edith to draw us a picture of the, was it a kind of a rectangle, the cloth, and was it folded, and was no, it round? It was long. Long skin thing. Long okay. Long. And so we'd, we'd like to figure out with some place to put this, that uh, and make a black shape in there. We'd have some black paint, and we'd like you to make a rectangle that somewhere. It was on the border of that river. It was on the floor okay. we crossed that river. Where would you put that black piece? Okay. This is, this is the river and this was still the dry land, you know, okay. this is where the woman was left. Florian and Alice were asked five questions. They drew their replies. Draw the first graphic image that you recall that made you realize that something was terribly wrong. I can see it, but to draw it. Just give it a try. Some people, you know, you'll hear them say, let me pray before you kill oh, me. Oh, yeah. So, <laughs> I don't know. Telling those people who want to kill them, because either way, they're going to kill them. And uh, this is like um, something they had. It's a, it was like a baseball bat, mm -hmm. but it had some... Um, the nails. The nails mm -hmm. in it. Mm -hmm. And they were hit with people, like, mm -hmm. you know. And then this is like a machete. Right. Mm -hmm. That's mostly what they used. You know, you'll be lucky if they shut you. Mm -hmm. so. Just within a few hours with the, when the genocide started, people just came out of nowhere. The neighbors that you thought were your friends, they turned evil and everybody was screaming. You know, you could just, I, that's the most thing I remember. Women, kids, everybody screaming for help. And there were so many of them you, and there was nobody who could help them because each person, if you weren't being killed, you were trying to run away to mm -hmm. save your life. So even though you heard the, you know, everybody screaming for help, there wasn't really anything you could do. Okay. Now the other thing that I wanted is, is, a, is a picture of you, that you drew in, in, of this person over here that's yelling help. If you could paint that really big over here, that whole figure saying help. What color would you like to draw the, uh, the big figure with the help sign on? Red. Anybody who were screaming for help, they would try to scream as louder as possible to see who can help them. And most of them, because of screaming so loud or with so much pain and worry, and because they are about to be killed, they would their voice would completely disappear. You can hear them. It's almost like they're saying help, but with a sorrow kind of voice, cry almost like they're about to cry. So, you know, their voice was no longer the same. They kind of lost it. You can't, I can't put everything that happened in just one 
just like a paper but this Simba is just that help that everybody was yearning for but yet it wasn't there they couldn't be helped On the 12th of October of 1940, we were told in our city all the Jews have to gather at the railroad station. We will be deported to the new territories. So four shipments, four rail cars left our city. We will put about a hundred people in one of these cars just like sardines. The distance between our city and where we ended up was about 150 miles. It took us three days to get there in these locked wagons. And it was just, it was just hell. The worst thing was we didn't have any water and thirst, you know, we just cramped together. And maybe there were small people and old people and people out of the hospital. Two people committed suicide in that wagon, in that um, cattle train. After three days, we ended up on a place called Taki. Taki was at the border between Romania and Transnistria, the Nesta River. 40,000 Jews were sent across the Dniester River. Edith and her family were sent to the banks of the river in July of 1941, but because of fighting in Transnistria, they were sent to Yedinitz to wait until the skirmishes settled. In November, her family was sent back to the Dniester River and dispersed over the territory of Transnistria. By well, why we were in Ataki, and we spent in Ataki the river probably a week, maybe more than a week, I don't remember anymore. But while we were there, we saw that group of people coming from their camp. They, they came by foot from their camp, and they were just like, like, like walking, like walking cadavers, cadavers. So evidently, this is when we, we met. I mean, without meeting. Without, without meeting. meeting. <laughs> without meeting. And they sent us across the same river where I used to spend my summers at Dniester, except in a different part of Romania. And how long did you stay on the riverfront the second time before you the crossed The second it? time, just maybe one night. The next day we crossed the river into Mogilev Podolsk on a pontoon or something. And then they sent us to Transnistria and there they put us uh, in, like, in ghettos. Well, we were thinking about the river being very important because there was a, a lot of stories what happened on the other side of the river. But we saw that this possibly being the river symbolically, or maybe this possibly being the river symbolically. You know, I gave you this picture this morning. Oh yeah, that's right. I, 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 was, I wanted to use that. Okay. Max had found some great photographs of Romanian Jews crossing the river from Niesta. This is people gathering by the river, right? They were going to be ferried across, right? They, were, they stepped on their homes, they came to the river, they couldn't pass the river. They made plenty people keep coming and coming and coming. At one point, 40,000 people got and gathered here yes. at one point in yes. the party, and they had no way to go and go to all over. I and all they had was that, 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 that ferry. Yeah. This is how they took 70, 80 people at the time. And this is, an, this is an actual picture of that. Yeah. An actual picture. Yeah. I just happened to find it in our encyclopedia. You know, here's what I see. Since we uh, kind of drew quite a bit of attention to this kind of smear crossing over this river, perhaps we can... Yeah, the smear is the crossing. Right? Perhaps maybe uh, this thing is the crossing. Can over. reference, I guess, the motion of the uh, ferry across. We can have, we can get rid of this white thing. We can have this thing going right into that river. This looks like water anyway. You know? yeah. So it's water from one view crossing water from another view. What do you think, Max? you think this is okay uh, coming down like that? I don't know. Well, why don't you play with it a little bit? Okay, yeah. Like that? Oh, that's kind of neat. You know what I like about this? It plays with the white sheets in the right. Yeah, it does that too, but look, look what it does. It does this. 
That's exactly it. <laughs> That's it. That's it. You like that, no? That's Everybody nice. like that? In Florian, here's this draw whatever objects were around you when you first heard the, heard the news about Rwanda. Florian was watching TV when she first heard news of the Rwandan genocide. Do you remember what was on the TV? At the, or you saw it on TV? Not saw it on TV. But the news, or was it like an image? CNN. Yeah, CNN news. Oh, mm -hmm. put that on there. Like, put um, CNN on the top, maybe. I'm... Is there like a certain image? CNN is everywhere. Well, I know on, on one hand they were showing O.J. Simpson. I will never forget that. Put that in there. Was it the car picture, the white picture? They were showing the, 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 the car from the sky? Y yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. I was, I was away, I was not in the country, I was uh, in West Africa actually, in Burkina Faso where my ex-husband was working for USAID and uh, I remember he had a, 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 a TV in the office, we had a TV in the office because was, I was working for the American Embassy and uh, they were showing O.J. Simpson all the time and uh, they, they, that's when I learned something happened in Rwanda because I saw the plane crash of President uh, Abiyarimana. Uh, that's when I knew there was trouble. Said O.J. Simpson was on CNN. How much coverage was given to the plane? This is... You don't want to know. It was O.J. Simpson over and over. And the story of Rwanda was not that important. They were showing um, the plane being shut down. And then just a few seconds later, they would show O.J. Simpson uh, how he, they thought he killed his wife and the car driving on the highway. I was thinking more about the... the the TV and uh, the OJ thing and how that really put a time on here. If I just look at this and I see the, the genocide stuff, it's sort of timeless, you know, like the meanings are so universal. I'm just thinking of a way to really put a, a time frame on this for, for me living here my whole life and to realize that, you know, I was, I remember that time period, but I don't remember anything about the genocide happening, that's, that's really powerful for me. I'm just picturing the, the, the image they played on TV over and over and over again of the SUV driving. And it doesn't need to be big, it could be small or something, but... Maybe that's the most important piece to show the TV, you know, the O.J. Simpson and then uh, the genocide in Rwanda. Are we going to put a TV anywhere? A TV? Yeah, because I was thinking we can, if we put a TV somewhere, then we can put the cars coming from the TV to some somewhere. Okay, and that answers your question, David. Yeah, that was my question, is, is how does the viewer even figure out what a car refers to? Because it's, it's this totally surreal element of the, of the story here that O.J. Simpson's trial mm -hmm. should have upstaged this completely separate story. So it does help tell the story. There is a picture that says help. Maybe put the O.J. Simpson story next to it because maybe, for me, I feel like at that time if people were aware of what was going on, maybe they could have had, we could have been helped. Okay. So it wouldn't have gotten as far as it went. And you know, the other thing you can interpret is you know, not, not only can you um, connect it to the O.J. Simpson, but you can also connect it to the way the French, the Belgians, the Americans, the British, when they were killing, they all left the country to go outside Rwanda instead of helping people. They just went back. They left. Yeah, they everybody left. left. They yeah. left them all alone. Mm -hmm. So you're calling out for help, but the world is turning its back. Yeah, to Rwanda. yeah, yeah. And they're following the O.J. Simpson thing into the TV. Yeah. You see, after we shipped over to Ataki, they put it in a barracks. You know, just imagine in that, in that barracks, probably, I don't know, maybe there were 2,000 or 3,000 soldiers before. You know, normal. They pushed in 40,000 people to these barracks. Uh, there was no running water, there was no electricity, there was no outhouses, there was nothing. It was just... So after, sometime after a week or two weeks, okay, they decided finally 
they are going to ship us within in the territory to disperse us over the territory. And they set up uh, probably about 70, 80 camps in the territory of Transnistria for the Jews deported. Uh, and from that barracks, about a thousand people at a time, at a day, were just s sent out. And this is when we had to go up that hill, because outside that, that uh, the city of Mogilev, on the way to where we ended up to, we had to go up that hill. It was a horrible way to, to they had to go on foot, it was raining, it was cold, it was November, I think, wasn't it? Yeah. My sister was sick and my grandmother was an old lady and my father thought we'll never make it and we'll have to, go, have to walk up that hill. And uh, there was a highway and on both sides of the highway there was a service road and the service road was not paved. It was raining, it was mud up to the knees mm -hmm. and they didn't let us go on the highway, we had to go on the service road, just go up that hill. Not, not everybody could make that hill. It was a, my father's auntie with us. He was probably in her 70s. Uh, she couldn't make up the hill. She left her just there. We don't know what happened to her. Mm -hmm. And they were not, she was not the only one. There were many people, children, elderly people, who could not make up the hill. I think we need a hill on this page. I see uh, using yellow right straight from the tube and drawing starting here, drawing right across the picture, a yellow line that stops here and goes underneath that and comes out the other side. So you you know that choice, and then you'll hear two or three others. Maybe not the shot, but it's... Maybe what? Show us what you see. Maybe the shot, you know? I'm just making it. You... I see this as the villain. As okay, one. this is Transnistria, this is Slovenia. Okay. That, that person died here. Yeah. So the and what is it has to start over here. there. It has to start because there. Because this is this is this, this almost looks like a yeah. start of it already. Yeah. It almost right. looks like a start of it. See this one here really, this would go like this. Well just keep all I have to do is just keep continuing. Like this. Yes. Take this as part of the pill. Right, right. yes, yeah, continue like this. Yeah. yeah. But <laughs> you see here, you see people going. So the other little tip is, is that it's meant to be, it's a waltz, mm -hmm. you know. It's meant to sort of come straight out of that world of, you know, the Eastern European okay. dance hall. Well, I'm a musician and I'm a writer. I'm a performer and a composer. And when I write music, I'm usually writing music for the stage. So film didn't seem so different for me. People assume that, of course, I'd be writing lots of vocal music for this because I am a singer. 
I, I was more interested in the instruments, actually. I'm also very enthusiastic about collaborating. I've collaborated with other performers and other media, uh, the visual arts, the performing arts, literary arts. It's just, I'm a collaborative artist. That's what I do. So in some ways I was a natural for this Voice Division project because I'm always interested in making that journey from a familiar place to an unfamiliar place. And so I wanted to do that with my music on this project as well. I had the incredible opportunity of actually being on set. So what I was paying attention to was not only their story and the remarkable artwork they were making, but the interactions of these people together, particularly Max and Edith. And what I noticed was they operated in several languages and when things got very intense, they always looked at each other and spoke to each other in Yiddish. And I thought that sense of layeredness was important for me to put into the music somehow. When I was imagining what this music would be, of course, one of the things that you imagine is what instruments will give body to what's being written. And I was interested in the accordion. That sound is so um, into the heart of Eastern European folk music. And violin, of course, is the folk instrument of Eastern European Jewish life and is a sound that's very, very dear to me. And then as a foil, which I thought would be interesting, was also to bring in a flute. In Jewish life, uh, the flute is a very, very old instrument, and it's the voice of celebration and of mourning. And I loved that juxtaposition, that the flute had both of those possibilities. And I was looking for that folk sound, and I was also looking for someone who played out of their heart, not who played out of their fingers and out of their virtuosity. That was important to me, that this music making uh, come out of the heart of the musician. So I chose musicians to play who I felt that was their principal connection. One old black, I remember one man actually was determined to kill my mom because he didn't believe his her you know identity was true you know and the way you know she looked because they can just look at you and just you know say you're not one of us or something. Their clothes were just full of blood. They had their machines still have like you know blood that kind of uh, dried on it and you know the. Um, the thing they call it in it was the the baseball bat looking, it still had almost, it looked like the people's mate pretty much, you know, you, you were still on it. And I remember that they wanted to kill all of us, but some, some one of them just said, you know, just go back where you came from, which that was actually a miracle because they could just kill us on the spot. Mm -hmm. That was the most dangerous roadblock in the whole country at the time. So we went to this other city, we stayed there for a couple of days, no food, no the same clothes we were wearing, nothing. Living in this, it was a primary school, you know, sleeping on the floor. And somehow um, one guy that was there knew my mother from, a, they grew up together. So he told my mother he would help us go back. So he he dressed in his army looking clothes and he had a gun and took took two of my sisters and put them in his car because they really look like tootsies and you know they were the main problem so he told us to just follow him we got back to that roadblock and the guys just went crazy when he saw us you know you're coming back i told you guys i'll kill you and you guys bringing themselves and everybody screaming fresh meat the guy got out, you know, he's dressed in the army clothes and he has a gun. He told them, if you touch my sister, this is my sister. Whatever blood she has, I have. This is my sister. You say one more word, all of you guys are dead too. They 
open the roadblocks, and there we went. That's how we flew the country. Wow. Florianne, Alice, Max, and Edith were invited to the studio to create a collaborative three-dimensional painting. Everyone looked through a collection of toys and picked out a few they liked. They were then asked to imagine how their toy would symbolize someone else's story. Some of these toys were put into the painting. And then the white horse in the background. Do you remember the, the white horse was Alice's idea? For me, um, when you're going through tough times, you can either choose to sit down and cry about it or have faith and strength to go on. And when you have that strength to go on, there's always a brighter side of what you're going through. And this is a white horse. So the horse represents the power, the strength, the faith they had. Instead of like his uh, aunt was uh, 70 years old, she couldn't go up the hill. The family could have chose to sit there with her and they wouldn't be here today. But yet, you know, sometimes it's not the best thing or it's not your choice, but you have to do what you have to do. And their strength, their faith to go on kept them, you know, going forward. Alice saw it as the white stallion that comes in for hope. Right. You know, that's going to save the day, you know. But the horse is going through all these barriers and loops trying to get out of the situation. And it relates to both cultures, like all the things that you had to do to survive and to, and to, to live on for another day. We have to add these two things to the picture. This is, you talked about elephants and touching elephant skin, and how wonderful that was. So we're going to have the elephant somewhere in here. Well, um, I chose the elephant first of all. Because not only are like elephants, I've touched them, I've uh, stood next to them, they are very impressive animals. And they always say, you have a memory of an, ele an elephant. Um, and they remember what happened to them when they were very young, so they still have the memory. Not only their memory, they are bringing it to our memory to keep the, um, the story going, to never forget, and also the toughness of, of uh, the, the elephant, to the skin. I don't know if anybody has touched a, 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 an elephant's skin. It has a tough skin, and they were tough to go through that time, physically, emotionally, and mentally. Uh, and they're here today to tell the story. So Edith had actually chose this as an object to put into the painting, into the work. What was her thought behind this? But uh, I picked the jewelry because it reminded me that uh, my grandmother bribed somebody to save my sister and me from a soldier that was wanted to take us away um, and convert us so that we may live because he said you're going to a certain death, you know, you will be dead anyways. So I was telling the story and David said that I wonder if there were occasions when you could bribe, bribe somebody to survive, to give, yes? Many more stories yeah. actually survived because probably of my father's money because there's quite a few times we were about to be killed but because he had money, he bribed them with the money to let us go. But when we put it up and, st and we had the, uh, the construction going, uh, this didn't quite fit in visually. This got a lot of attention and so we didn't, it's only a part of a story, not the uh, center of the story. So you have to kind of like take its importance away. So we found a different one that was actually smaller, it was a little curved uh, necklace uh, that was uh, rhinestone jewelry, but it was uh, it had black uh, rhinestone with kind of quality to it, and, and, and it actually worked better in the picture. And also, uh, it represented to me a flavor that looked Western and also looked African at the same time. Well, the first time I picked a little girl um, because when she starts saying her story. I kind of could relate to it because she was about nine years old, they said. And I was around that age when things happen. And it's amazing how she still remembers everything at this age, at the point that 
she can tell somebody, share her story, and some somebody can learn something from it. And uh, to make the story short, I hope that I will get to that level that I can tell my grandkids what happened and they can learn something from it. And David brought up an interesting point that this little girl, the feet are still, but the arms move, which can be, the arms can reach out for something. So if it's a memory, your memory will always stay with you, but you have to reach out to let the people know what that memory is to you or to let them know what you went through to teach them. And we decided to remove the arm from the doll and have it on uh, the other side of the construction. And we were trying to figure out where to put it. We decided that the missing arm was the idea of that you went through some sort of um, physical thing where people were injured and died and, yeah. and lost limbs. And the idea of that the viewer puts it back together and finds the connection and you don't provide the path. But mm -hmm. it's a subconscious or unconscious idea that when you see it, you're looking for the other half. We came during the next night. We stopped in a kolkhoz. It was a the kolkhoz was a, you know a collector farm. Sure. Uh, so they let us stay overnight. So I had with me a silver watch of my father's, a mega watch. I figured I have to hide it because if they if they, you know, if they find it, you know they take it away from us. So it was, there was a, a stove there. So I put that watch in the stove. Well, they came during the night and moved us out from there and I couldn't retrieve that watch. It wasn't a stove like what we have here. No, it was a, you know, it was on the... It was just a, a chimney. A chimney. <laughs> Three years later, on our way home, we went through that place. That house wasn't there, but the chimney was still up. So I figured maybe I'll look through that down and I'll find that watch. I did find that watch. Okay, <laughs> it was the, the, you know, the... The glass was broken, okay, one of them was broken, but I found the watch, it's an Can you show it to us? Yeah. You must have just flushed from head to toe <laughs> when you found it. But you see, Mayor, how important it was to us to hide this. Yes. That's be Not great. because it was my father, because it was some value, you know, you were That's able, right. you know, people, you know, on the way, you know, it, on the way, people would come out and, and with some with some food. So used to you used to exchange. You used to yeah. give them a shirt for a, a loaf, of, loaf bread. of bread, and you know. This is really neat. This idea, as a visual symbol to me, the watch without any hands on it. Mm -hmm. That's there's something there. Now, Florian, you must have been really nervous. Were you keeping up with your family um, and any communication, or was it like when I finally left the country, you got you, you kind of... I tried to draw a telephone that it was cut off. <laughs> <laughs> so there was no communication. Did you get through it all? Uh, what, what, even second? Uh, only some people, who, some of my family who had reached Europe could call me, because okay. they were outside the country. And so you kind of... Hoping you get another phone call, another, and mm -hmm. everybody would come together. Huh? Yeah, well, it, well it, those, the ones who were not in Europe, I couldn't. I yeah. didn't know what happened for many months. Now, there, there was something really interesting about your drawing, Florian, uh, when you drew the telephone. I'd like to see you paint the telephone in some ways. Somehow, it being drawn right in the center of this energy field here mm -hmm. uh, might be a good idea. Um, it could be any size, it could be small, like, I think it should be as big as you can make it, it shouldn't be fit inside, it should be busting out of this circle, like just arbitrarily drawn as big as you can make it. Or do you see it somewhere else, or should we even not put it in? Why, if you can tell us why you see it but, in the circle? Maybe it's, it, it's corny, but I saw all that energy coming out of the circle as the frustration. Mm, okay. 
What were you thinking of when you made the circle and all those things coming out of it? Did, I know it was just kind of uh, breaking the ice, you know, but uh, did you see it as a, as, a, as a sun? No, actually when I started, I looked at, remember the, uh, like the baseball bat I told you they were killing people with in the genocide, oh yeah. but with nails <laughs> in it, which they will hit people with it maybe on the head or whatever, so you can die suffering. And that's the main object I remember through the genocide the most because that was probably the worst one. That's People the preferred best. to be shot than being killed with that thing because that's yeah. a, a slow, painful death. Being shot, it's quick and you're done. And so, so I never knew this. So that big circle, what, that was the spikes coming because we never had a conversation. And we that. didn't, and now I see it. Now the telephone inside the spike could make sense and not getting through. Mm. Right. That's interesting because my impulse was the telephone uh, belonged lower down. Mm -hmm. If we're talking about that river of blood or whatever that band is, that's because it, because here you are trying to reach your family that's being engulfed in that violence. Mm -hmm. But um, if if that circle actually is referring to that violence, maybe it works up there too. But my impulse was lower down. Me too. Well, my first instinct was also down below, um, maybe as like a, a transition between the peace and the war. I think the circle thing, to put it in a circle would be better because I think for her, the experience she had, knowing, I don't know how you would feel knowing your family is not okay, but yet you can't know what is really going on, the frustration she had going on, or the stress, so what, the, what was going in her mind. So I think the little... So like thing, it's in the center of this bath. Yeah, you know, all the that, yeah, the confusion that you know they're not okay, <clears throat> okay. but yet you don't know what is wrong. That's a tear. No, I like it though. It's yeah. beautiful. Crying, you can't get through. One of the musicians on the project is Jean-Paul Samputu. He's an internationally known musician from Rwanda. Florian is good friends with him, and that's how we got him on the project. I met Jean-Paul in 2004, when he came for the 10th anniversary of the genocide at the university at Kaufman Theater. Jean-Paul's sister is one of my very good friends from Rwanda, but she lives in Canada. She told me Jean-Paul was coming, that I make sure I meet him. And Jean-Paul was a good friend of my brother-in-law, so they knew each other, so we, we went to see him. And I introduced myself, me, I knew him when he was a baby, so I could not remember him, because he was much younger than me. So that's how... You I mean, remember Jean-Paul when he was a baby? He was when he was really young. Really? Yeah, wow. really, because his sister is much older. Yeah. Did he remember you? No. No? no. <laughs> the name, yes. Yeah. Just the name. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, the music I heard of her just had this immense joy to it. It made me wonder, who is this guy, and um, what does he mean to the culture of Rwanda now? How, what's he drawing on to make that kind of music? Most of it is, he picks it from traditional music, traditional songs, and, and he uses traditional instruments too. Mm -hmm. uh, he uses guitar sometimes, but he has a lot of uh, traditional instruments. Mm -hmm. The music that comes from him, he's a very compassionate individual. Mm -hmm. And I think what he does is he, he uses 
his compassion, his own energy, to sort of uh, express what he's feeling. And, and it touches the world because it's in such a, a real sort of uh, expression of what his emotion is all about mm -hmm. with it. And, and I think that's what I find very attractive with him is it's, it's not contrived at mm -hmm. all. It's very, it's very real. And I don't know if he does that consciously or unconsciously, but uh, the end result is, is, is you get connected to the sound because it is authentic, basically, in terms of his interpretation mm -hmm. of that. After having picked out colors, tan and burgundy, to symbolize the bad times, Max and Edith picked out colors to symbolize the good times. Max chose teal, and Edith wanted to use pink or red. Let's, let's get that dog color out and see which, which one's a, a crazier next to it, okay? Which one's a crazier contrast? I think this is more of a contrast because this is the warm family and that's the cool family. <clears throat> Whereas these, are, these two are related in a way and I don't think you want to have the opposites of good time and bad time relate to each other in any way. Teal was picked as the color to represent the good times. When the war ended in 1945, Edith's family did not go home because it had been annexed by Russia. They made their way to the town of Rodots, where Max had lived. After the war, Max worked in another city, but went back to Rodots regularly to visit his family. This is where Edith and he met. And somehow our families knew each other. My father knew his father. I didn't know her. And there is where we met in 1949 in Rodots. Yeah. In 1949. I, I was think. a friend of, of uh, uh, his cousin. So we got married in 1950. He used to come to visit his sister. And I remember seeing him walking with his sister and thinking, that would be a nice guy for me. <laughs> I swear that when I didn't dream that, that we would get married, that was really quite a coincidence afterwards that I met him. We wanted to symbolize the Goodman's love on the canvas and what we chose to represent were these two shapes. This shape represents Max and this shape represents Edith. We um, photographed the shapes and we put them in Photoshop. And we took this uh, shape and we stretched it out. And then the art team and I pasted the stretch shapes onto the canvas and then painted in the original shapes. And the idea was the stretched out shape was the experience that they went through, this abnormal, uh, horrifying experience. And they're leaving that shape to meet each other. They're leaving their experience, uh, former experience, and meeting each other and starting a new life. We were trying to think of a title for this painting and uh, rather than concentrating on some of the negative things that happened to them, uh, uh, the idea that they were married after their liberation. They met and fell in love and got married. And we called the painting, Love Will Set You Free. When Alice and her family fled from Rwanda to Zaire, now the Democratic Republic of Congo, they stayed at a church where her cousin was a priest. Alice's mother had become very sick by the time they arrived. During the genocide, she was pregnant, and one time they attacked us, a group of, I believe, about eight people, and she was the one who opened the door, and the guy who was in front pushed her back with the gun so hard, I think, he moved the baby, and she was already sick because, you know, she was pregnant, she wasn't getting the treatments, and mm -hmm. not, we were not eating. You can't eat in a genocide. So all that just took over that. And then she, I think she kept taking probably painkillers, you know, with the pain she was in. So by the time we got to Congo, she was just very sick. I, I remember she was very, very skinny. She was able to give birth to the child. The child was not normal and he didn't survive long. 
Um, he died on Monday, my mom died on Thursday. So here's what we have so far. The piece is called Before a Long Time Ago, and it was a collaboration between Max and Edith, who had experienced the Holocaust, and Florian and Alice, that had experienced the Rwanda genocide. As we were going through the photo album um, that Florian had brought, um, we found a photograph she had taken on vacation while in Kenya, and it was a photograph of two giraffes um, that were standing kind of next to each other with their necks crossing like this. But in that, we kind of found that connection of uh, two cultures crossing and meeting, which happens, of course, in the work, but also um, in their experiences, too. I believe we chose the angel Gabriel because Max had a direct relationship to the angel Gabriel because of a tapestry that was in his home. That's right. We had a, we had a, a tapestry. It was an angel carrying, carrying a little child. My mother said it's a protecting angel. A green woman used to come every morning and bring us some milk. A quarter of a milk, a quarter of milk, I don't know what. For, at the beginning we paid, we paid for it. Later on we didn't have any money anymore, then she still kept bring, bringing us. She was a very nice lady, supporting lady. One day she said, well, maybe I should show it to that lady, to that woman, maybe she can get something for us. So my mommy went out and showed her that, that tapestry. So that lady said, she crossed herself, she said, this is the angel. This is the angel Gabriel, he said. This is the, the patron saint, saint of our church. I have to show it to the priest. So my mother gave her the, the tapestry to show it to the priest. So she came back next day. She said, my, the priest would like to keep it for our church. And he's offering you three sacks of flour for it. Three sacks of flour? My God, this kept That's us going. more than ten thousand dollars. Ten thousand dollars now, no. you know. But it kept us going for months. That he didn't deliver it at one time. He delivered one sack and the second time, but he delivered it, and this kept us. Going. You see, a miracle happened. <laughs> Wait, how's your writing coming? Do you have any? Um... Anything that you wrote um, that, that would be appropriate to, to, to read I a paragraph? I wrote something last night. Hold Why don't on, you go get it? Okay. It's not can... professional done. It's no, no, it's just, it's just getting uh, ideas down. Why don't you read a little bit of that? Okay. It... <laughs> this is a book. Uh, uh, it's this... just personal, though. Yeah, it's but a... this is going to be in a book you, you, you Yes. Write. So it says, today I, th I thought to myself, why do people I love the most always have to leave me? Sometimes I wish my mom could have waited just a few more years to teach me things that I can never teach myself, to help me grow, and, just, and I just wish I had a chance to say goodbye, to tell her how much I really, really loved her so much, just for her to hold me into her arms and tell me everything is going to be okay. People always tell me the more I grow into a woman, I look like her more and more. Gosh, that makes me feel so good and happy. But I don't want to just look like her. I want to be like her, the way she was. A strong woman, great friend, great mother, a loving and caring woman. She always had a smile on her face. I'm, so I just wrote, I miss you so much, Mom, and I love you more than ever. And it hurts knowing that there, there ain't nothing that that would make you come back, but I know God is taking good care of you. I know in heaven, I know you are in heaven. I'm going to do my best so that when Jesus come to get me, I'll be able to see you again. And this, and this time will be, it'll be for good. And I say, rest in peace, mom, I love you.
When the artist began this painting, its initial colors were blue, orange, tan, and burgundy. Blue and orange were the colors used to begin Florian and Alice's painting. Max and Edith had used tan and burgundy. This combination of color palettes was symbolic of the exchange of experiences and cultures that took place during the making of the painting. I don't know much about art, but it looks like a Picasso. <laughs> I have a very emotional response to this piece that is not about necessarily understanding its details, mm -hmm. but uh, the, there are clearly different languages going on here. It's almost like a, a wall in the city that's been tagged with graffiti. Mm -hmm. um, and the fact that there are all these different languages tell me that there are different stories being told here, but all of the people telling the stories are somehow in the same place in the same time telling that story. And that hits me really hard. Uh, that is so astounding, because that's exactly what this project was. And the color palette here is just so exciting to look at. Um, it's so unexpected uh, to have those, the blue and the orange and the burgundy and the gray. I don't have to understand why you made those choices, because it's, it's um, creating an energy that um, makes its own impression. It's not starting from the conscious mind first. But the next thing that we're, we're gonna work on as a group is um, this idea of fine tuning. What you're gonna be doing are looking at the paintings and seeing what small changes could really make it strong in some areas or maybe what things you wanna do away with. They don't need to be very big moves. They don't need to be huge changes, but maybe they're just going to be making lines a little sharper. Like these lines are so clean right here on the edge and maybe like right in here, maybe you want to make one of these sides of this line, you know, you want to make it sharper and more distinct. Even if you want to like play with these on here and take these and set them, like what it would look like if you just added it to some areas like there on the black. So that's the kind of thing we're looking for, is like minor fine-tuning and how it makes something in the story or something connect better or worse. Why don't we make a, a, a team of three, uh, each uh, person who's a storyteller has two people to work with and discuss the moves, okay? Then after you come up with the one move you're going to do, we'll put the cameras back on, we'll give the reason why you're doing it, and you'll do it, okay? <laughs> Does that sound good? So we can shut the cameras off now. Who would like to go first? Anybody want to volunteer to go first? Well, Max is already up there. We, we can okay, go ahead. put it right up there. Well, why don't you take it down and put it back up again? Okay. <laughs> I'll take it out. Max, do you want to put it back in? Okay, yeah. So Max decided to, to put the reflective plastic, slip it right there, and have it come through on the other side. Okay, that works. And then he talked about how it brought this alive, this part here. It actually yeah, started to, to bring this piece out more. So I think that's a good move. Yeah. So what, now what made you um, get that move? Was it you just played around with a piece of plastic? Well, or was there this looks so dull, this piece of paper. Oh, you mentioned that before. <laughs> <laughs> that was really bugging yeah. you. <laughs> I think this will give us some life. Yeah, yeah it does. does. It does. Okay. Good choice. Yeah. Good choice. <laughs> Okay, who wants to go next? Which group? We should go. Okay. Okay. Do you want to talk about it? No, uh, you can do it together. We'll do it together. So Florian was interested in making this dancing figure um, have arms. That, uh, that that was a missing element for her. So it appeared that what we were going to do either with the paint or with the object was to help create that. But we, we had an interesting discovery, which is, is that perhaps there was already one arm unintentionally um, attached to the body. And so then we thought, well, um, maybe using this um, piece of plastic, we could create in its own sort of surreal way um, an, another arm.
Okay, so that's really, that was a good move. This is giving it a really exciting final tune up here, <laughs> outside of our thinking range. And that's what collaboration is all about. I'd like to welcome everybody here. This is a special treat and pleasure for me. I'm just really pleased to uh, introduce J.D. Steele and his band here today to uh, entertain you for your support. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, let's uh, give them a warm uh, welcome and uh, the J.D. Steele back. Florian is building a children's village in Rwanda, and this is the fundraiser for it. What we are planning to do is to build an, a village for the children. In Rwanda, they don't like to call it orphanage anymore because they don't like the traditional institutions. They encourage children in homes with mothers. It was reported in October 2006 that there is 1.25 million orphans in the country of Rwanda. And the size of the population is 8.5 million. And that's a large number of orphans for such a small place. And we will have 10 children in each home with two mothers, two widows, because there are thousands and thousands of widows after the genocide. So they will, they will be in those red roofed homes, 10 children and two mothers. And uh, we, we are hoping that when this project is all done with, we will have 150 children. So that's why we have 15 homes on the site. The banquet was held at Temple Israel, Minneapolis, Minnesota. Tomorrow evening in this very building, the Jewish community will gather to remember another tragedy, Yom HaShoah a day of remembrance for those who died and whose lives were torn apart during the Holocaust. Six million Jewish souls and countless others who died at the hands of the Nazis during World War II. Their suffering calls out to us and echoes with the voices of the people of Rwanda who have suffered countless tragedies of their own, their own Yom HaShoah, their own Holocaust. I felt that this Parallel the project because it brought the two cultures together to share their experiences and, and uh, the banquet was doing the same thing. And I'd like to, to give a joke since I saw Oprah opening a school in South Africa. I don't have Oprah's money, but I have friends. <laughs> and make this happen. And once it happens, we will all have a hand in this. So I would encourage you to spread the word, let the people know that we are, we are here, we are official, and uh, that we want to help the children of Rwanda. Thank you very much. Why race?